Hello and welcome to today's lecture on storage technology. This is the second lecture on this topic and in the last lecture we have discussed about magnetic disks, optical disks and magnetic tapes which are used uh, as uh, storage devices. And today I shall focus on flash memory which is one of the uh, storage technology that is used and that is flash memory technology has led to solid state disks. The, I shall discuss about those solid state disks and then uh, to improve the reliability and availability we shall discuss how multiple disks can be used together and leading to uh, what is known as red 0 to 6 red levels redundant array of independent disk that is the acronym that has been used to this uh, uh, to this uh, technique I mean where multiple disks are used together and there are 6 different levels 0 through 6 I shall discuss about them and then I shall conclude my lecture by considering which ones to be used in what situation. Uh, I have already discussed about flash memory in the context of uh, main memory. We have seen that flash memory is a form of electrically erasable programmable ROM uh, and uh, only difference with electrically erasable and programmable ROM is that uh, it, this flash memory allows a block to be erased or written in a single operation. And as you know it is based on floating gate avalanche injection metal oxide semiconductor technology and uh, we have seen how electrons are trapped in a floating gate as it is shown in this particular diagram, uh, uh, how the electrons are tap, trapped and uh, as the electrons get trapped in the floating gate the threshold voltage is reduced and that is how reading and writing can, uh, can be done. And particularly in for flash memory reads can be done at the speed of dynamic RAM that is at the in the range which is in the range of nanosecond. On the other hand writing is rather slow uh, uh, which, uh, which is done in, uh, in the I mean at the speed of uh, millisecond. So, write is a complex operation because you have to uh, I mean allow the accumulation of electrons in the floating gate and that is why the writing is a complex process and takes longer time. And flash memory has become very popular in recent years particularly in embedded systems in portable mp3 player uh, because of their low power consumption, fast read and as I mentioned write times is much slower than DRAM. But uh, in the embedded applications like mp3 player where it is primarily used for uh, reading, it is rarely used for writing most of the time you are reading. And it is costlier than dynamic RAM about uh, 6 times costlier than dynamic RAM and price per megabit is about 6000 6, times that of magnetic disks. However, price is falling and that has led to the development of solid state disks. So, most systems designers as you know dream of replacing slow mechanical storage as we have seen the magnetic storage is based on you know driving uh, a, a magnetic I mean plate uh, disc by a motor and as a consequence it is very slow and it is not very reliable. So, uh, this slow and mechanical storage to be replaced with fast and non-volatile memory that is the dream of most of the system designers and particularly the advantage of, ad, advent of inexpensive solid state disk uh, based on flash memory technology and eventually on storage class memory which has evolved based on this uh, uh, flash memory is beginning uh, is bringing this dream closer to reality. So, it has become uh, so, that dream is coming true and particularly this storage class memory based on uh, uh, this, uh, this solid state disk or uh, flash memory technology has the important properties like non it is non volatile, short access time, low cost per bit uh, and solid state because there is no and it has got no moving parts because it is based on solid state, solid state technology. And uh, we have already seen the use, discussed the use of uh, flash memory in the context of main memory. So, main memory requirement is fast 
expensive and volatile, you know main memory is much more expensive. So, it satisfies uh, more or less both the requirements, that is that's the reason why uh, the solid state disk uh, blurs the distinction between memory and storage. The requirement for storage is slow, cheap and non-volatile. So, uh, in case of solid, uh, this, uh, this uh, storage class memory, uh, you know that distinction between memory and storage has reduced. In other words, it can be used for both the purposes. Okay, with this background, now let us focus on how we can improve the reliability and availability uh, by using multiple disks together. So, the innovation that improve both performance and dependability of storage systems is to use multiple disks together. So, this is not a very new concept as we know whenever we try to improve the availability, we use multiple devices. If one fails, other one will serve the purpose. Similarly, for the purpose of reliability, uh, we can use uh, multiple disks where you know uh, we can do, uh, have some kind of redundancy which will allow you to have higher reliability. So, that is the basic concept behind multiple disks, I mean using use of multiple disks together. So, it gives you not only reliability and dependability, it gives you better performance uh, because throughput can be uh, throughput can be increased uh, by having multiple disks serve, uh, serve several pieces of single data set. That means, uh, since we are using multiple disks, the throughput can be increased by uh, by parallel access of the disks and serving uh, and then that uh, a single data set can be uh, accessed from multiple disks and that is how the throughput can be increased. And we shall see that distribution and is data is done by a uh, technique known as stripping. Actually, different blocks of the same data uh, data is uh, is uh, placed in different disks, and that approach is known as stripping in the context of this uh, this uh, multiple disk memory system. So, the problem is that when one adds components to a system results in decreased dependability. As you know, whenever the number of components increases, say instead of one component, if you have an n component, obviously the possibility of failure uh, of the entire thing, I mean one of the n, n components increases. So, reliability in way in, in that way decreases. However, uh, that this is based on the assumption that all devices must be operational for the system to be working. Only then uh, you know uh, this uh, reliability or dependability decreases whenever we have n devices and have and the uh, reliability becomes 1 by n of the reliability of one device. However, we do not use the uh, multiple disk in this manner as we shall see. Uh, so, better availability is achieved. Uh, in this way, if a disk fails, then while it is being repaired, data, uh, repaired, data can be obtained from other disks. So, uh, that means, whenever we are using multiple disks, you have, uh, you can access one disk and uh, if a particular disk fails, then instead of accessing from that disk, we can access from other, other disks. So, uh, that is that is done because of the replication of data data is fully replicated on other disks so uh, either you will read from the replicated data or there is another approach which can be used that data can be reconstructed reconstructed from the data on other disks so if a particular disk fails then uh, from the replicated data that is uh, where the duplicate information is stored because uh, by incorporating redundancy you can read it from there or from the remaining disks which are available, which have not failed from those disks that are can be reconstructed. We shall see how it can be done. One important issue is what if other disk fails while a disk be, is, is being repaired. That means, uh, uh, so far as the single fault is concerned, it can be easily uh, I mean tolerated or in the sense that availability or reliability can be improved for a single uh, disk failure, but whenever uh, that means, whenever one disk is getting I mean uh, regeneration of a particular disk is uh, taking place from other disk, say if another disk fails, then what will happen? 
Now, let us see uh, whether this is uh, uh, possible or not. It has been found that the mean time to failure, so MTTF is a very important parameter, MTTF, mean time to failure. So, this figure uh, is quite large, it has been found that uh, of a disk is tens of years. That means, a particular disk does not fail in alternate days. So, failure is very uncommon and rare. So, once in maybe uh, several years, tens of years it happens. However, uh, that MTTR mean time to repair that time is very low. So, MTTR of a disk can be as low as hours. That means, if a particular disk fails that failing that it will fail may be once in 10 years, but whenever it fails within few hours it can be regenerated or it can be I mean a new disk uh, can be placed in place of that faulty disk. So, in such a case you know uh, since the mean time to failure is very long uh, and mean time to uh, re regeneration uh, repair is uh, very I mean is few, only few hours it does not pose any problem. That means, there is a pos the possibility of multiple disk failing is is extremely low because of uh, these two figures. So, therefore, statistically there is no problem, the possibility of two disks failing together uh, will not happen in practice. Now, question is uh, there are two important technical issues by which mean time to repair is uh, reduced. So, how do you detect uh, whenever a disk fails? So, there are there are there are uh, there is uh, you have to understand the technical uh, aspects behind this behind the operation of these multiple disks. Say you have got n disks in a multiple disk sem. Question arises: Which one has failed, and how to uh, how to find it out? Fortunately. Uh, the the disk which has failed generates a flag. So, it is a self generated signal that means, the failed the disk which has failed will generate a sig signal that it has I am failed, I have failed. So, uh, that is a very good thing luckily all disk return error information. So, a flag is generated and so identification of a faulty disk it does not pose any problem. Now, how do we make MTTR as low as possible that is few hours? That can be done in two ways. One concept is known as hot spares. In such a case, unused disk that can be quickly used to replace a failed disk. That means, what can be done? Uh, few disks are already in the rack which are not being used. So, those are known as hot spares. It is not that a disk has been kept in the Almira that uh, if, uh, the disk ha is already there, it is uh, in the system, but it was not being used. So, uh, as soon as a particular disk fails, it can be uh, it can be made operational very quickly that is known as hot, sp hot spares. Another possibility is to use hot swapping. So, whenever uh, a particular disk fails, it can be taken out and a new disk can be uh, placed. So, hot swapping is without shutting down the system, you can put in a new disk, a, I mean a disk which is not faulty. So, replacing the disk without shutting down the computer at all. So, these two techniques are used to uh, reduce the MTTR, it can be very small. Now, uh, we shall discuss about a technique which is used uh, for the purpose of improving the reliability and availability and the technique is known as redundant array of inexpensive disks or uh, in short it is RAID. So, redundant array 
of inexpensive disks. So, redundant at this R A I D. So, this is the acronym that is being used and this I sometimes is instead of inexpensive, it is also uh, used uh, in, 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 uh, for independent. So, independent or inexpensive, uh, I mean uh, either to any one of them or both of them can be used, uh, it does not matter. And so, this is the standard way of using multiple disks to increase throughput and or reliability. So, this uses a RAID controller to make things transparent to the user or program. In the previous case, as you have seen, whenever we do hot spares or hot swapping, sometimes manual interface intervention is required. Uh, but in this particular case, whenever we are using RAIDs, then there is no need for any manual intervention. The, the, the automatically the RAID controller uh, will that is an electronics that is present in the system will take care of. Uh, will make thing transparent to the user or programmer, user uh, or the program that is running. So, redundancy can deal with one or more failures. So, uh, what can be done? Uh, uh, we, as we shall see, uh, either single failure or multiple failures can be tolerated and each sector of a disk records check information that allows it to determine if the disk has an error or not. So, uh, as we know, uh, some uh, error detecting codes or error detect I mean codes are usually present for each sector. So, either parity or some other technique checksum whatever may be whatever it may be that is being used to detect any error for reading a sector. So, whenever that happens we know that a particular disk uh, is uh, has become faulty. And when a disk read, uh, disk read flags, are, uh, flags an error, turn elsewhere for correct data. That means, whenever that flag is generated because of incorrect reading uh, uh, from of a sector, then it generates a error message or you can say disk uh, uh, flag uh, flags an error and we have to turn to other devices for getting correct data. How it can be done, we shall see. So, as I mentioned, there are uh, six different red levels. First one is known as red zero. So, although we are uh, using uh, the terminology redundant, as we shall see in case of red, red level zero, there is no redundancy. <coughs> and the, the main thing that is being done in red level 0 is data stripping across multiple disks. So, uh, uh, uses a fixed uh, use a, uses a fixed strip sizes and this is transparent to the users or programs and what, what is being done say suppose you have got uh, 8 disks. So, this is one disk and in this way you can have 8 disk. <coughs> so, uh, one strip is stored here that one strip that is usually a called a block. We have already seen that uh, data that is that can be accessed from a hard disk uh, minimum unit is a sector. So, a sector of data can be called as a block in the context of hard disk or if we go for bigger size block then it, it may involve multiple sectors. That is why that uh, we do not use the term sector, uh, but uh, you can have uh, a block which is bigger than a sector, but it has to be bigger than a sector. So, 0th block is placed here then the first first block is placed here, then the uh, eight block is placed here. So, in this way data is distributed in eight disks. Uh, you may be asking uh, what purpose it will serve? The main purpose that will serve is first of all uh, it will give the illusion of a larger disk. So, that means uh, you can store 
a large amount of data uh, and uh, it will give the illusion of a single disk. So, uh, since it is transparent to the user, they will feel that the capacity is now 8 times that of a single disk. And, uh, and also it gives you higher throughput. As we know, we have already seen whenever you read data from a disk, it will involve uh, several uh, I mean parameters or times, seek time, then, uh, then rotational time, rotational time, then transfer time, now, all these times are involved. But here all these things can be done parallel and as a consequence it will give you high, uh, it gives you high performance. So, it uses routinely for high performance computing applications like rendering, scientific computing. Uh, so, as I mentioned ironically, although you are using the term uh, RAID, uh, it has no redundancy. So, it provides high data transfer capability. So, it is just a bunch of disks. So, uh, that is the uh, terminology sometimes used, just a bunch of disks. JABT. <coughs> okay. So, this is red level 0. Now, let us come to I mean uh, how it is being done, this is shown here. So, here the user have the illusion of a single logical disk of large capacity then there is a array management controller which distributes the data to different disk. Say this is this you have got in this particular diagram four different disk, disk 0, disk 1, disk 2 and disk 3 and where data is distributed so strip 1 goes to uh, disk 0, strip, uh, strip 0 goes to disk 0, strip 1 goes to disk 1, strip 2 goes to disk 2 and that distribution is done by this array management controller and the user uh, uh, have a logical uh, disk space. So, whenever it reads then the array management controller will read them from different disk and provide the data to the user or the program which is running. So, this is your red level 0 and uh, this shows how it really works. Coming to red level 1, so this creates an exact copy of a set of data on two or more disks called mirroring or shadowing. So, in this case what we are doing uh, to improve the uh, reliability and availability, you are doing what is known as mirroring. So, suppose this is one disk and here you have got another disk. So, same data, so if you are storing block B0 here you will be also storing block B0 here. So, you are using a concept known as mirroring or uh, which is also known as uh, shadowing. So, this is this is then in the context of a uh, context of only two disks and uh, since you are uh, using uh, mirroring and shadowing, uh, although you are having two disks, the capacity is equivalent to that of a single disk. So, in this case, uh, this is the very simple redundancy and very simple and that was widely used in many uh, applications in the early years of uh, redundancy. Uh, and when uh, whenever data is written to a disk, it is also written to another disk. So, in this particular case, uh, reading uh, can be, I mean uh, reading can be done either from disk disk where block 0 is stored or or can be read, you can read it either from disk. So, there is a possibility of reading from both, uh, uh, but usually data is read from one uh, uh, main disk not the mirrored disk. Only when uh, the main disk fails, the data is read from the mirrored disk and uh, in the meantime the regeneration of data uh, takes place in the failed disk. So, this is how it really works. The system automatically gets data from the mirror disk and uh, regeneration takes place in the other disk. This is how red level 1 works. So, in this particular case as you can see uh, the redundancy is maximum. You are 
uh, you require double uh, the number of disks. So, whenever uh, uh, you are using this type of the red level one for the, for the purpose of uh, improving the reliability and availability. So, because of this large requirement, I mean requirement of so many disks, this is rarely used and uh, uh, this, so, as I mentioned higher availability, but expensive to store x gigabytes of data, one need to purchase 2 x gigabytes of storage. So, you can do some optimization read from disk whose arm has the shortest traveling distance to this desired sector. So, this kind of optimization can be done as you have seen uh, 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 there is a uh, you, 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 there is a uh, the seek time seek time is dependent on uh, where the position of the arm and since we are having two disks uh, storing the same data. So, you can identify for which one arm is nearer to the uh, track that has been referred by the access. So, then you can access from that particular disk. So, that kind of optimization can be done uh, and data request can be served by either of the disk and recovery from failure is very simple as I have told already explained. So, this is red level 1. Then coming to red level 2, uh, you have started with a sentence uh, red 2 is not being used, but since in the original document of red, this was also uh, mentioned for the sake of uh, academic interest, we shall be discussing it very briefly. Uh, uh, this is since this was defined in the original standard and this is also expensive in terms of disks so, and also expensive in terms of controller. Why it is expensive? You can see we are using the, the, the conventional technique of error correcting codes, error correcting codes for the purpose of uh, uh, regenerating data. Uh, that means, in this case uh, as you can see uh, here you have got four disks and to, to make it uh, feasible for correcting code automatically, you will require three additional disks where uh, you have to store those uh, redundant information. So, that uh, you can regenerate data whenever a one of the disk fails. So, in this particular case, I am not going into the details of error correcting codes, you may have studied it and you will require large amount of redundancy for four disks, you will require three additional disks to store information and, uh, and uh, is uh, the, re the redundancy requirement is quite heavy. So, that is why uh, this is not used. However, most disks provide ECC by default nowadays, but this is done. Uh, not in the disk level, it is done within the disk. So, that is why error correcting code are not provided in the in this way, but uh, within the disk you can use error correcting code because uh, you know disks are very unreliable medium and error correcting code is uh, provided within the disk. Then coming to the uh, red 3, data is bit, bit interleaved across several disks. So, if separate disk maintains parity information for a set of bits. So, uh, here you are using the concept of parity bit for the purpose of error detection and correction. Actually error detection uh, is done uh, by the disk itself as I have already told the disk uh, will give a send a flag, flag. So, whenever a disk has failed that is known. Now, from the remaining disk you should be able to regenerate data by using the concept of parity bit. That is the basic idea of this red level 3. So, uh, for example, whenever you are using 9 disks, you are storing uh, 8 bits of data in 8 disks, bit 0 in disk 0, bit 1 in disk 1, bit 7 in disk 7 and so on. And then disk 8 is used to store the parity bit. So, for any read, you will require 9 disks to be accessed. This is a very, this is a, uh, uh, this is a important point you must notice. So, whenever you are performing reading or writing, you have to access all the disks. That means, whenever you are reading, 
you have to read all the all the nine disks must be accessed whenever you are using nine disk or uh, if you are using five disk you have to use read all the five disk because after reading those bits you have to check whether you have read correctly or not that means parity bit has to be compared so for any write nine disks must be accessed uh, as parity has to be calculated so this gives you high throughput for a single request since you are reading from uh, multiple disks so you are reading parallelly so it, it will give you high throughput and redundancy overhead is much smaller only 12.5 percent uh, whenever you are using nine disks that means one extra you required uh, for eight uh, data so one by eight uh, in percentage wide it is 12.5 percent so since uh, the interleaving is done interleaving is that means you have distributed bit wise that uh, uh, all read writes go to all disks so time to recovery is very long because you require you will require computation you have to read from all the disks then if a particular disk fails then you have to uh, read all the disks then you have to regenerate the other disk so uh, the time to recovery is very long because of the calculation of the parity bit and wasted space is uh, is only 1 by n as i have already mentioned compared to 1 by 2 that is used in red level 1 so since failures are rare it is better than red 1 in most of the situations so if you compare red level 3 with red level 1 uh, red level uh, 2 uh, actually it has to be red level 2 uh, where redundancy is used uh, your this this is a better scheme so this is the uh, simple idea of parity bit how it is being used for the purpose of regeneration of data so the parity bit is defined as xor of the individual bits on the disk from it one can reconstruct lost data for example whenever you are using five disk four disk for storing data and one for parity disk let us assume the initial data is 0, 1, 1, 0. So, parity bit can be easily calculated uh, since you are using you are using even parity. So, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 the even parity bit is 0 bit. So, you will store 0 in that uh, uh, disk where you are storing the parity bits. Suppose uh, we have uh, lost a bit that means this particular disk that uh, first uh, the bit disk number 1 has failed. So, this has failed you can reconstruct the data from the other disks including the parity disk. So, we then take the XOR of the 3 remaining bits of and the parity bit that means uh, 0 exclusive or 1 exclusive or 0 and exclusive or this 0 and that gives you 1 and indeed this is the uh, data. Uh, that was present here. So, you can easily uh, reconstruct the data from this. Suppose, we have lost another bit say this bit has been lost after uh, this and here also again you can calculate the, uh, uh, the, the find out the bit value to that was present here in the same way and you get 0 and indeed 0 was present mm -hmm. uh, as you can see here. So, in this way uh, this, uh, this uh, the bit interleaved parity can be easily used for the purpose of uh, regeneration of the data whenever a particular disk fails. It can be done in the block level as well. Suppose you have got data 8 bit data D1, D2, D3 and D4 stored in 4 different disks. So, you can compute the, the parity D1 exclusive or D2 exclusive or D3 exclusive of D4 to get uh, the parity 11010000 for the data uh, which is shown here. Then suppose that D3 has failed, if this has failed you can regenerate the data to be stored in D3 in the same way D1 exclusive of D2 exclusive of D3 4 exclusive of P gives you the data that was present in the disk D3. So, this is how you can do it in the bit level or in the block level and that is the reason why uh, instead of single bit in the bit level uh, the red level 4 has gone for block interleaved parity. So, in this case the idea is same as red level 3, but improved. How it has been improved? 
because in red level 3 we have seen every read write goes to all disk because data is interleaved at the bit level. So, you have to read some meaningful data, you have to go uh, read all the, you have to access all the disks, but that need not be done whenever it is block interleaved. So, whenever you are reading a small amount of data that may be present in a single disk instead of reading from all the disk for small data, I mean for large data if, uh, say more than a block, if it is uh, if it is only one block then you can read it from a single disk. So, that idea is being used uh, in red level 4. So, data is stripped in the block fashion, fashion so the, that way small read involves only one disk. So, an application can then do many small independent reads to multiple disk. So, this allows you to have uh, multiple reading for multiple applications. So, multi, in case of multi program environment, uh, multiple users can read from multiple disks in the block level and that is the reason why it is more desirable than bit, bit, bit level scheme of uh, read 3. However, the time needed for reading data will be longer, same volume of data. So, block interleave, uh, interleaving reduces throughput uh, for a single request as I have already mentioned as only a single disk drive is serving the request. So, you have to transfer the entire data from a single, single disk, it will take longer time, but improves the task level parallelism as other disk drives are free to service uh, other request as I have already told in a multi programming environment whenever you are using task level parallelism that can be helpful. Uh, in this, in this, uh, in the thread level four, can be helpful. So this is here how the data is stored is shown here: block zero, block one, block two, block three. The corresponding parity, block level parity, is stored here. Then block level four, five, uh, six, and seven are stored in four different disks. Corresponding parity is stored in another disk, and so on. So this is your red level four. Now coming to uh, <coughs> When writing data, one must read all disk and recompute the parity bit. So, this is a significant overhead as we have uh, already seen. Uh, suppose you, you, you have you have got four disks. So, say D0, D1, D2, D3 and this is your parity. So, uh, suppose this is the new data you have to write. So, what you have to do? You have to calculate the new parity by using all the uh, data that means, you will perform exclusive or operation. Then you will write in that new parity bit, it will go to the new parity bit. This data will go to uh, will go to the new disk. So, that is your D0 dash. Then of course, you will be having D1, D2, D3 and D4. Sorry, you will not D0, D1, D2 and D3. So, in this case as you can see, you have to read uh, uh, all the disks. So, you will require 3 reads if you are having uh, say four data disk. If you write on a on one of the disk, you have to perform three reads. Then of course, you will be writing in two disk uh, that is uh, required. So, the number of reads that you have to perform is long, can it be reduced? So, whenever you are using uh, this red level 4, uh, what you can do? You can use a better scheme. So, better scheme is like this, you do not have to read so many disks. So, suppose it is this D0, then you have got D, uh, D0, D, uh, D0, D1, D2 and D3 and this is your parity bit. Now, uh, you have to write in D0 dash in any case. Now, for the calculation of parity, what you can do? You can use these two bits exclusive or and also this can be uh, you can perform exclusive or with this old parity and you can write a new parity. And of course, D0, D1, 
d 2, uh, d 0 is already there, d 1, d 2 and d 3. So, in this case as you can see the number of reads is 2, but whenever you have got 8 disks, in the previous case your requirement was if you had 8 disks, data disks, then you had to read from 7 disks, 7 uh, I mean read uh, you have to read 7 data disks. But whenever you use this scheme, whenever you use this particular scheme, you can see you can you have to read only uh, 2 disks, number of reads is reducing. If it is 8, even when you have got 8 disks, you will, you will require only 2 reads by this, by, the, by this enhanced scheme and you can calculate the parity, you, can, you, will, you will find, you will, it can be proved that you get the same parity, new parity whenever you do it in this manner. That means, the parity that is being generated in this scheme will be same as the parity that is being generated in this scheme. So, uh, you will require lesser number of reads. and that is what is being done in red level 4. <coughs> and so, uh, in this particular case whenever you are writing, you have to perform writing on the only on n minus 2, n minus 2 disks. If you have got n disk, you have to I, I, this leaves n minus 2 disk unused. So, uh, they can be used for other com computations, the more disk the larger the saving. So, as I have already explained. Uh, within the context of 8 disks, 9 disks. So, this is your red level 4. Then coming to the red level 5, uh, uh, the, in the previous case we have seen that uh, data was uh, the, uh, the parity bits, all the parity bits were stored in a single disk. That means, whenever you are performing, uh, 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 trying to perform uh, writing, then you have to access that particular disk and also suppose you are reading block B0 and block uh, B5, writing block B0 and writing block B5. So, what you have to do? You have to access block B0, you have to access yeah, sorry disk D0, disk D1 and also you have to access uh, the parity disk twice, because uh, you have to modify this uh, P0 to 3 and P4 to 7. So, this leads to a bottleneck. This bottleneck can be overcome by using this uh, red level 5, where the parity data is distributed uh, across different disks. So, th uh, though the parity data for a block is never stored on the disk drive that stores that block. So, what you are doing here, uh, the, uh, you are using uh, say for example, P 0 to 3 is stored in disk, uh, disk 5, then P 4 to 7 is stored in disk 4. P uh, 8 to 11 is stored in disk 3 and so on. Suppose, if you are reading, if you are writing B 0 and B 5, so you can see you have to modify uh, B 0 and B 5 means you have to access B 0 and uh, disk D 0 and disk uh, D 5 sorry D 4 and also whenever you are modifying uh, writing uh, block 5, then you have to access uh, the disk D1 and disk uh, um, D3. So you can see you can do it parallelly, and uh, so the, the bottleneck that bottleneck arising in uh, red four red level four is overcome. So main advantage is is allows multiple concurrent write writes as I have already explained, and that is the reason why this red level five is very popular and it is widely used in most of the commercial systems. I believe our discussion will not be complete without considering red level 6. So, red level 6 extend the red level 5 by adding an additional parity block. What is the, why, why do you need additional parity block? The need for, the need for having additional parity block arises to take care of multiple failures. We have seen uh, from red level 1 to red level 5 they can tolerate single disk failure, but there are situations where you have to handle multiple failures. For example, an user instead of replacing a faulty disk has taken out a uh, good disk, correct disk. 
So, in such a case it will lead to multiple failures. So, it will be, it will be difficult to regenerate the data whenever multiple <coughs> failure occurs. So, to take care of that situation red level 6 is used where two types of parities are used. One is that uh, row oriented parity that is the row parity. So, you are using one disk to store the row parity that means, the row parity for 0, 1, 2 and 3 uh, uh, that row parity is stored in this disk 4. In addition to that you are storing another parity which is known as diagonal parity. So, diagonal parity uh, how it is calculated? Diagonal parity is calculated for all the diagonal elements. For example, that uh, diagonal 0 corresponds to disk 0, uh, disk 2, uh, disk 3, uh, disk 4 and disk 5 and uh, the diagonal 1 corresponds to disk 0, disk 1, uh, disk 3, uh, disk 4 and disk 5. So, in this way diagonally uh, the, the number that is being shown here the parity is calculated uh, on those uh, for, for those diagonal elements. However, as you can see if you are having uh, p, uh, n disks uh, the, the, the parity is restricted to p minus 1. So, if you have got p disks altogether p minus 1 carry parity is calculated on p minus 1 disk. So, uh, whenever uh, multiple disk fails for example, disk 1 and disk 3 has failed together. So, how do you take care of uh, that situation? So, whenever both disk 1 and disk 3 has failed, uh, but that simple row parity calculation will not be uh, will not uh, uh, will not allow you to regenerate data in uh, disk 1 and disk 3. So, in such a situation you have to uh, you have to resort to this uh, diagonal parity. For example, uh, this, uh, this uh, disk 1 and disk 3 fails then we find that uh, that that parity 0 that uh, the diagonal parity 0 in does not involve disk 1. So, you can regenerate data for disk, uh, th the third disk by uh, using the diagonal uh, diagonal elements that 0 diagonal elements and because uh, one of the, uh, the faulty disk is excluded from there. Similarly, you can use uh, say diagonal 2 for regenerating data for uh, disk 1. So, in this way two failures can be uh, I mean whenever two more than one failure occurs you will be able to reconstruct data uh, using the uh, diagonal parity that is the basic idea of red level 6 and, and, and if you want to have I mean uh, tolerate more than two faults then you have to keep on increasing the uh, number of parity disks. So, if you want to tolerate three faults then you have to add another uh, additional disk, but as we have already seen that the possibility of failure is I mean that mean time to failure is uh, is very long. So, uh, this red level 6 although uh, theoretically it has been proposed it is rarely used because red level 5 satisfies most of the uh, requirements because single failure is uh, is uh, is uh, is that what uh, occurs uh, occasionally. So, double failure is very rare and so red level 6 is not commonly used. Uh, so, as I have already mentioned uh, recovers two or more failures you have to go for red level 6. So, drawback is that waste twice as many storage space as, as red level 5 and more parity data needs to be updated on a write. So, whenever you are writing data this will be more complex because you have to uh, write data uh, um, not only in the row parity also you have to uh, write data in the diagonal parity and as you can see you have to perform uh, I mean access of multiple disks to uh, generate the, uh, that the, the row parity in the block level and diagonal parity in the block level that calculation will involve access of uh, several disks and so that is why uh, uh, writing is uh, very uh, complex and it will take time and one that is the that is the reason why this red level 6 although it has been proposed 
uh, after red 5, uh, it is not commonly used. So, now the question is uh, which one to use in what situation? So, red level 1, this is good when uh, need for high fault tolerance at low overhead, but wastes a lot of storage. So, we have seen where we are using mirroring uh, or shadowing, that thing can be used uh, when you want very high fault tolerance and used when parity is deemed insufficient. That means, parity bit, uh, the other techniques are based on parity bit, but red level 1 is not based on parity, it is based on mirroring or shadowing. That is why when parity uh, bit, uh, when parity is deemed insufficient, this particular technique is used and used for small databases or individual users seen, uh, since red uh, one controller are cheaper. So, it is simplest and red level 2 is not commonly used as I have already mentioned because it is based on error correcting codes and it is not at all used. And red level 3 applications with large files and requiring high transfer performance. So, this is bit oriented interleaving that is used when you, you are dealing with very large files and that requires very high performance. So, basically these applications one red 0, but uh, without fault tolerance. <coughs> then coming to uh, red level 4, uh, sort of compromise uh, between uh, red level 3 and red level 5 and not commonly used. And red level 5 as I have already mentioned, it is the most popular uh, seen as the best trade off between fault tolerance, storage space, overhead and parallel transfers. So, this is the most popular one and not good for write intensive applications because we have seen whenever you are doing writing, then it involves uh, more overhead and uh, I mean uh, in that case you have to, it is better to use red level 1 and red level 6 as I have already mentioned not really popular and higher cost than red level 5 and the two failures uh, case is rare for disks and that is the reason why red level 6 is not used. So, this gives you a summary uh, of the uh, different type, the redundancy that is being required. Red level 0, uh, there is no redundancy, red level 1 has the largest uh, redundancy. So, uh, where you use mirroring or uh, shadowing and red level 2 also has got high redundancy. You can uh, for 4 disks, you will require 3 additional redundant disks. On the other hand, red level 3, 4 and 5 all the three will require single additional disk to store the parity bits. So, uh, and out of the three, we have seen that red level 5 is the, uh, cho uh, the choice of the day because of uh, many good features. Red level 6 requires uh, two, uh, two additional disks, one for uh, that, uh, that row parity, another for that uh, uh, diagonal parity. So, one additional disk is required here, which can tolerate more than one, I mean double fault, tolerance of the double fault. However, it is rarely used and not commonly used. So, this summarizes the various red levels and, uh, and commercially in all the disk storage systems, you will find uh, particularly red level 5 is commonly used. So, with this we have come to the end of uh, storage technology. And in the next lecture, we shall discuss about some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some, you know, that the processors, some uh, processors which are commercially available, we shall discuss about them. Thank you.